So it is week four. It's amazing. It goes by quick. Um, we're going to be going over some interesting information. We're going to be going on cognitive and sensory impairments, family-centered care. Of course, pediatrics all about not just a child, it's a family. And then also we have variations, which means there's a difference between children and an adult's size of equipment, where and how we draw bloods, urines, or whatever. Children are different in that regard, and we have to remember when we're trying to do assessments on them. Now, the one thing I want to tell you is I did went and I scored NCLEX and your CJ Sims. If you got a zero, go look at the comments. In the NCLEX questions, if there was a zero, it's because you didn't do growth and development. You did only pediatrics. So just get them in by Sunday. No deduction. Don't worry. Yes, I know it's extra but um, it needs to be growth and development. The second thing, CJ Sims. I need the, I don't care if you take a picture of your computer or if you can print the screen where you have your name in the top or right, do you need what the CJ Sims you did, the date and your score. Those four things must be there. Again, if you saw a zero, go back to CJ Sims. And anyone who is repeating, I can't take yours from last quarter. You must redo them. Those are the things that I saw. Again, I told you in the first week that if I saw it, I'd give you a zero, but I would tell you why, okay? So if you got a score, you're good. If you didn't, please check it out. I want everybody to get all the scores they can possibly get, okay? So I decided, I believe, I'm going to do the PowerPoint for you. I have about an hour and it's 80 some of slides, but I'm going to get through it. How does that sound? I will send you the Kahoot, which is I have 40 some odd um, questions. And I'll send you the Wednesday night recordings as they're going to get the Kahoot. Okay. How does that sound? It's because you guys have an extra half hour class. I'm able to do it. And I think it gives you all the everything you need in order to be successful. Exam grades are not out till Saturday about two o'clock-ish. Um, I can't do it, um, an item analysis, which means I'm looking at every question. Were they fair? How many of you didn't understand those questions? And those questions together as a group, the pediatric professors and myself will say, okay, that question we'll give back to the students. We do occasionally do maybe one or two questions, but that's about it. Anyone less than a 78 or anybody who just wants to know what questions they got wrong, make an appointment with me. We could do it before class, after class, or another time, as long as I'm not in meetings or have another class, okay? I'll work around your schedules because I know you're probably filling in more into your time slots than I am right now, okay? So, Exam grades will be on Saturday at two o'clock. So let's go ahead. Let me share this PowerPoint. I did send it to you um, yesterday. I always try to, on Sunday, give you everything you need. So it was sent. So cognitive sensory impairment. Cognitive impairment is basically mentally, uh, it's an intellectual uh, disability. We think sometimes of children of cerebral palsy, right? That's one of the ways that you might see it. It could have been some sort of hypoxic episode at birth, maybe something like that. Now, cognitive impairment, we would notice because they're not meeting developmental milestones. And those children, we would start early interventions, right? So we have educatable and trainable students, um, students, uh, cognitively delayed uh, children. So educatable means that we can teach them. We have had Down's children that have gone to college. Um, some colleges have a mentor that goes with them to class to make sure that they uh, are understanding. And then, of course, we have the trainable. Maybe they work in a factory. Or I know in where I live, I go to the grocery store. They are packing my bags and they do an actually really, really good job. And then you try to give them a tip and they're just not taking it because they're told not to. 
I said, here, go get yourself the soda and then they'll take it. So again, mild, moderate, severe, and profound. Um, we know most of it is mild. Uh, a lot of them, um, you know, could be that moderate, but very little uh, children are in severe. Why does it happen? Well, a lot has to do with prenatal, has to do with birth, and then it has to do with, you know, something going on in the body, metabolic, endocrine. So we know infections, we know trauma at birth. You know, sometimes children aren't premature, like these little tiny ones I'm showing you here, but they're full term and they get stuck. And then you have to pull their heads or suction their heads and things can happen because of that. Could be inadequate nutrition. Well, go figure that. We know without nutrition, children don't get fuel in the tank and their brains are not going to work. And if we don't catch it quick enough, it's going to be a permanent. All right. We know chromosomes, downs, right? One of them. Prematurity, absolutely. Um, they have uh, the ability in their brains. Their vessels are so fragile that little movements and sound can cause what we call interventricular hemorrhages or brain bleeds. And that brain bleed can cause some sort of delays in the children. We know there's environment and psychiatric. So how do we do and treat cognitive dysfunction? Well, you know, some of you are um, in the Cutler Bay campus and I know that that campus goes to patches, which is an amazing um, pediatric prescribed daycare. Um, these are children, many of them, cerebral palsy, downs, autism, all of the ones that are all cognitive delayed in some manner or some way or some physical condition. These children, from the moment they get to their, quote, school or daycare, they have early intervention. These children do amazing because they get the speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and it teaches them to do more than we ever thought they could do before. Children who cannot speak need a mode of communication. Now, I know this one little boy, he's still at Patches, was my boyfriend. He's down in the uh, toddler room downstairs. And this little boy is nonverbal cerebral palsy, spastic cerebral palsy, but he has a pad. And speech therapy has taught him how to speak. This is little Jonathan. So if you ever go there, those who know who I'm talking about, this child can talk. And this is our goal for any child who is delayed. And that's why we have all of these special little pediatric extended daycares, right? For therapies. Just because they're cognitive delay doesn't mean they can have a fit and not pay attention to the rules. There is discipline, okay? Just because you don't think they understand, let me tell you, they do understand. Discipline, they need to be around other children. What about the autistic child? They don't like people around them. They don't like to be touched. They don't like lights, noise, people. They need to be around other ones. I've seen children autistic get along and be in those environments and do well. Yes, they'll play alone, but they do join in group activities. As they get older, remember cognitive delayed children are very innocent. They don't understand that people can abuse them physically, mentally, or even sexually. So they need a good concrete code of what's a good touch, bad touch, what, and what should I do if something happens, right? Also, what if you have a kid who is bored, cognitive delayed, and it's gonna be a lifetime of it? Well, you need that family, that ability to adjust and give them the resources that they do need. And these children in the hospital need parents more than even the little toddlers. Um, they don't like to be without that support person. How do you prevent cognitive impairment? Well, all that prenatal care, right? All genetic counseling, um, you know, exposures to smoke and alcohol and drugs, all of that. And then that folic acid supplementation. You're going to hear this all the way through this course. Any woman who wants to get pregnant should be 
one month before getting pregnant be on a folic acid. So get a vitamin who has it in it and that's good enough. Now Down syndrome, mentioned it a couple times. Now, usually when you think of Down, you think of chromosome 21. That is the normal, uh, normal type of uh, Down. But do you realize it goes 21, 18, 15, 11, and nine. Now, the one who's a nine is severely cognitively delayed. I saw one in my whole career. Child had half a heart, um, couldn't breathe without a ventilator, uh, was blind, um, had only three fingers and two toes, um, and the child lived to age one, um, most severe. Uh, the 21 are the usually the educatable, um, are the sweetest, kindest children who love hugs, okay? We know a lot of times they blame Down syndrome on maternal age. The older uh, mother has more risk. So what does a Down child look like? <laughs> well, when I first see a, a newborn baby, and I've worked in newborn ICU, cardiac ICU, and the reason why cardiac ICU, Down's children have more susceptibility to be or have a cardiac condition. Could be a simple just hole between the bottom chambers, but it could be some more complex stuff too. Also, if you look at the physical problems, they can have problems with their thyroid gland. So remember thyroid gland, you don't get enough thyroid at birth, it's gonna lead to cognitive delay from birth. So you're already down with hypothyroidism. Now you really got a double whammy on making sure that we do everything to get their cognitive awareness where it should be. And the last thing is leukemia. So those are things that they can have. So that's why cardiac is important uh, with these children and looking at them. The first thing I usually look at is see if they have the creamy crease in their palms and their palms and their hands and their soles at their feet. That's the first thing, because sometimes you can't tell that facial look yet. But usually we have square um, heads. The eyes are slanting, more almond shaped. They've got a flat nose and this tongue that's always sticking out. You will notice that in these daycares that are taking care of these special needs children, Speech works with them so closely, their tongues don't stick out like you normally see. In fact, that's one of the first things, being a professor and their clinical professor, I was like, wow, they really work hard on that. And then the last thing is they can put their legs over their heads, both of them, and they're just so hypotonic. You know, everything moves in directions that's just not normal. Um, just be careful with, you know, maybe you want them to do it. Their hips can pump out of joint. So be careful. And remember, if you have a Down child, these parents should go under chromosome analysis uh, and the child find out what's their number. So we know how we need to do that intervention, early intervention. And then is it something that's, you know, in the body that maybe another child could have it? So there's just another little picture for you of what you're gonna see. So what do we do for Down's children at birth? Well, if they've got a congenital abnormality like cardiac and it needs repair, you need to fix it first. You need, of course, sight and um, hearing needs to be looked at. If you can't hear, you're not gonna talk. It's gonna be a garbled nothing, remember that. So hearing should always be tested with any speech problem. Again, checking that thyroid gland, making sure it's working properly. If not, they're going to need oral thyroid medicine. Families who get Downs need to know about their children and all the everything that's available to them um, so that the child could be the best they possibly can be. And of course, you know, looking prenatally, what's happening? What sort of child do I have? Now, fragile X is the second most common of all the genetic reasons why something like a Down syndrome. Now, fragile X is just like Down syndrome. 
with the cognitive um, delays, et cetera, but their face looks a little different. They've got this long face. They've got these big ears. Their jaw comes out more. In males, it's their, testic their testicles, as they get older, are going to just be bigger. They're just really more, they're bigger than you do expect on them. These children are mild to severe cognitive awareness um, impairment. These kids, uh, like the others, will have, but more delayed speech and language. They're hyperactive. They're like an ADHD, Down's child, aggressive, aggressive. Down's children aren't, they're lovable. They're huggable, right? So these children need to be on medication. That's the difference. Down's kids know. They're only on medications for the heart condition or the thyroid condition. So these are the medications, Tegretol, Prozac, because of their behavior, and then that hyperactivity, maybe they'll put them on something like Adderall, you know, to help them calm down. And always, always, always in these children, early intervention. I met a Downs autistic child that I watched one morning go into his, his daycare. And he took, he got out of the bus because they bust them. They bring him in and he went, took his backpack, put it in his cubby and he sat down and waited for his vital signs. I mean, you had to remind him once or twice, just keep sitting until they did it, but then he'd go off and play. Now, Down's autistic child knew what was going on because of what? He had been in early intervention since he was very, very small. He knew the routine. Now, hearing impairment. Remember, if you have hearing impairment, you're going to have speech impairment. Many times, um, if the kid is getting older and then the hearing impairment occurs, it's the speech that starts sounding funny. When you start seeing that, get a hearing evaluation, okay? We know most kids are born, you know, and they can hear, but there are times they don't. It's sometimes you don't have the ear formed. Maybe it was some sort of prematurity. Now, oxygen is great. Now, premature infants usually can't breathe. They're on a ventilator with oxygen. Sometimes the oxygen can hurt their hearing and their sight. So we've got to be careful of that. Also, premature infants go through many times of being in sepsis. They're infected. They need an antibiotic. They're placed on which one? Well, vancomycin. Vancomycin is nephro and ototoxic, and that can kill the ears too. So it could be asphyxia, it could be infection, cerebral palsy, but many times if there's a hearing impairment, children today are tested before they can go home when they're newborns. So there's conductive, sensor and neuro, mixed conductive and central auditory type of uh, problems. I mean, you know, you don't have any conduction or you don't have the nerve that's telling you what to do or it's, it's getting confused in there. It doesn't know, you know what to do with the sound. So anyway, it is, you need to do something for your kid that you can. I mean, you're going to be number one, testing them, seeing, is there any hearing at all or not, okay? Um, and again, um, it might be a medical or surgical intervention. Maybe there's something they need to do in the ear, or this is the cochlear implant. I know I first started seeing these on Facebook where you had a parent taking a picture of a kid hearing for the first time and they would talk. Um, it's still a little bit garbled because they still don't know how to pronunciate, but these children start talking and the parents are sitting there crying. And I just think it's amazing. I actually heard one. Um, I was down at uh, a big hospital in the area for my sinuses, so ENT, you know, that area. And the kid in the next door got his first cochlear implant and I heard the commotion and I actually got tears in my eyes. I think it's great. A kid who can't hear who all of a sudden can hear their mommy. Now, what would you see in an infant? Well, you go up and clap your hands and they don't move if they're sleeping, right? 
So auditory, they no, no um, thing, nothing, no response. Well, that one absolutely is going to have to have something to help them to hear. What if they're older? You know, by uh, one year old, they should be saying mama, dad, dad, something, nana, hopefully for me. But um, if they're not, and if it's, and the, the sound that's coming out isn't right, well, again, hearing test, check it out, see what's going on. And then, you know, they're walking away and they're not responding to you. That's another one. So there's a couple different ways that we'll know. And it could be because of, you know, ongoing um, ear infections, et cetera. So this is a little girl, the cochlear implant, you know, and, you know, she's sitting there and she's listening. So when you have hearing impairment, um, as a nurse, we need to be able to communicate with them. Um, sometimes just putting up a picture board, right? Um, some of them, if they are ongoing hearing, maybe they have one of those pads where they can point to what they want to talk, right? Child life specialists are the most amazing people. I know down here in South Miami at the area pediatric hospital, they use them unbelievably. And probably it's my right arm working in the emergency room for my last 10 years there. It was great. And they'll come in and explain kids, kids with special needs. They have been educated, growth development and needs and what to do. And they really make it easy for us nurses. So utilize your resources. We know taking care of reoccurring um, ear infections um, can help save the ears so that they don't um, become diminished hearing. Also prenatal genetic testing. And then, of course, being careful of those ototoxic drugs. That's your responsibility as a nurse. Monitoring those peaks and troughs, making sure we're not over giving these doses because it can, it'll burn the ears out and it will kill the kidneys. And we don't want to do anything to hurt our children. Also, sexual transmitted diseases. Look at that, so syphilis. Rubella, we know pregnant women shouldn't be around it. And that ABO compatibility, that's when the bilirubin, the blood fights, the positive and the negative, a positive, a negative fight, and that can cause hearing problems too. And the last thing we don't think about, a child born with normal hearing, you got to be careful with noise. You know, um, I know I watched uh, American Idol, and this is a couple of years back now, but there was the, fina the finality. And uh, one of the women had an eight-year-old child that came to the finale. They put ear pieces on them over their ears because the sound was way too loud for them. So no concerts, you know, be careful with the sound in your car, not a super speaker in there because it can hurt the hearing. Visual impairment, we know there's partial and legally. Um, and again, we know uh, vision can seriously affect learning, right? Again, it could be caused by infections or this retinopathy of prematurity, ROP. That's the oxygen in the premature infant burns the eyes in the retinas. Now, there are special surgeries they can do, but it doesn't mean they'll get complete vision back. They'll get some of it, right? Also, infections always is gonna be in there. But then there's disorder, sickle cell. There's blood vessels in the eyes. It could sickle in the eye. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. You have joints in places that you don't know because that affects joints. I have had issues with my uh, voice box. Apparently, there's a joint in there, and every now and then it gets inflamed. Or you hear me with a raspy voice. It is my rheumatoid arthritis. So you know, these things can happen. And then Tay-Sachs has to do with fat and buildup, et cetera, et cetera. How do we test vision? Well, there's all different types of vision boards, whether they are arrows up and down and sideways, pictures, you know, just pick one that's developmentally appropriate. Again, 20 feet away, one at a time, then toast, uh, test both. So 20 and 100, 
I can see at 20 feet while others can see at 100. So it's showing that there's some visual disturbances. Again, whenever there is less than normal, we need to report that. Myopia, hyperopia. Can you see near or can you see far? You know what drives me nuts? Nearsighted is when you don't see far and farsighted, you don't see near. <laughs> and, and it's opposite of what you think. So myopia, you can't see far. You need glasses for vision, for distance. And hyperopia is farsightedness. I can't see near like me. I need my reading glasses. Now, there's other conditions, the eyes and the muscles, and things happen. They don't form right, and we need to exercise them to get them back. And that usually does it. Cross-eyed is when they basically strabismus. There are two eyes, and they work independently and cross. So usually, after the age of like nine months, this one eye and one eye working become not two eyes, but one working together. And what happens is now there's no depth perception and the eyes cross. And that's when you see cross-eyed. Most common, amblopia. One eye sort of goes around and goes crazy. Now, how do we treat these things? Usually it's putting a patch. Now, on um, amblopia, you put the patch on the good eye because you want that bad eye to work, right? So you strengthen the muscle. Trauma, you know, kids are always getting stuff in their, their um, eyes, dirt, uh, running into things, you know, it could be many stuff. But whenever you have an injury to the eye, you know, our job, because um, uh, you'll have, uh, sometimes if you're in a doctor's office, the parents will call like, kid just got something, it's in the eye, what do I do? Well, if it's just floating around, they could take a tissue and get it out. If it's penetrating, they need to put a Fox shield, which is a hard like eye patch on it, both of them, and get them to pediatric ER or to a pediatric ophthalmologist because you can have more uh, problems with it and we want to save our eyes. One of the most common things with children is pink eye, right? Conjunctivitis. So we know that we put antibiotic ointments in it. Uh, one of the things about antibi uh, antibiotic ointments, children, when we put it in, even adults, and it gets blurry vision, they think they're going blind. Let them know that, it, and usually we only do ointments at night right before bed. But if not, tell them it's going to be blurry for a little bit. Once it gets warm and liquefied, then the vision's going to come back. That's scary, you know, to know that. So I can't see. All I came in is with goop in my eyes. Another thing I tell parents, and this is just for your information, if you have a kid diagnosed with conjunctivitis, tell them to change the pillowcases every day, right? Because if you don't, they're just putting it back in their eyes. So nursing assessment about visual impairment. You know, make sure that we, those children that are premature or have other conditions that we check really, really closely, you know, making sure we do those visual exams. And if we see doing, looking at the eyes and they're not reacting to light, there's something wrong that needs to be reported and investigated. So children that are born and even the older ones that don't see, you need to promote an attachment. So that's by touch, right? If they can't see, they still can hear, having the parent spoke to them, speak to them, right? And then you're gonna need things to develop their independence. Um, as a child um, in a hospital, you're gonna show them, walk them around the room, show where everything is, and do not move anything because children know steps and how to get around and they don't run into things at home. Same sort of thing. And, you know, um, all of everybody who's in that room needs the same 
And then they're going to need something to educate them. You know, we can listen to books or whatever, but then, of course, as they get older, there is Braille. They can also read. So let's do some prenatal care. Let's get all the children with rubella immunization so that pregnant women won't be around it. Be teaching these children all about when they fall down, you know, to be careful with their eyes. And then kids do need periodic visual assessment. Kids who are hearing or visual impaired tend to um, fingerspell. They, they seem to um, are slower in development because they can't hear or they can't see. It's sort of expected. And again, that early intervention will help them. And, you know, developing goals, and they're always met and always make new goals with them. So they are going to take more time, but it doesn't mean that they're cognitively delayed. It just means they can't hear or see. Now, retinoblastoma is a tumor, but we put it here because it's visual. I've seen one, and it was an eight-month-old little girl. And when I looked at her eyes, one was this, it almost looked like the bottom right. I could see something was wrong there. And it's a tumor in the eye. And it is cancer. The eye actually has to be removed on that one. We'll go into that again, but um, that's just the start. You know, autism, I just, I've started to talk about a little bit. And we know autism is more common in boys than girls. We usually do not diagnose to about two years old because there are other things that could be wrong. So we don't diagnose it yet. We know it could be due to many things. Now, what would you see with an autistic child? The kid's gonna play alone, not like touch, not like sound, not like bright lights, don't like other people. And then they're going to be playing alone in the corner, doing repetitive, restrictive behaviors. You know, they'll, for instance, this little boy, autistic, who was down, would go after he was set in, would go in the corner, take a fire truck and put it on top of a step, and then take a ball and put it on top of it and put another little car on top of it and cover it with something. Then he'd take that off and take this out, that out, thing, put it down, and do it over, up, and down, again, and again, and again. And you can sit and watch him, and he'd be there for a long time doing the same things over and over again. So it was very easy to diagnose him. It really was. It could be caused by genetics, immune, environmentals, and, you know, there is a high risk. If you have one autistic child in the house, maybe another. I worked with a nurse who had an autistic son and her second son was born one year after the first. He had it too. And then she got, oops, pregnant with a girl and she's perfect. But she's got two little boys that she's working with, very active with the autism uh, foundation, et cetera. So these are the things that you normally see, the problem with people, communication, behaviors, Oh, and they don't look you in the eye. <laughs> they just don't. And they don't talk hardly at all. You know, just like a one-year-old, maybe one word. Um, and again, diagnosis always is later. There's no cure at all. But if we institute early, early as we can intervention, you will see a lot of good things from them. Again, recognizing it early. Um, not accepting any bad behaviors and a structured, structured routine. And these kids can improve and, you know, can be calmer. They know what's going to happen. Having an autistic child is hard on the whole family. So, again, um, making sure those parents have all the resources that they can have. And, you know, mom doesn't have to be superhuman or dad or whoever's raising the kid the closest. You know, they need somebody to talk to, too. So I would always recommend counseling with it. So the nurse is discussing sexuality with the parents of an adolescent girl with moderate cognitive impairments. What should the nurse consider? So you've got a cognitively impaired adolescent girl. What is one of the biggest concerns?
her Remember being taken that advantage of. They can absolutely be taken advantage of. So they do need C. They need a well-defined concrete code of sexual conduct. Good touch, bad touch. What to do when they feel something that's wrong, right? Because they don't know. They need to be taught that. So family-centered care during hospitalization. Well, I think one of the biggest is getting to the hospital and mom, dad, bring them in. And they can't stay all the time, many of them. And then that's when you see the separation anxiety. So initially, they're screaming and yelling and going crazy, you know, when the parent leaves. And it just breaks the parent's heart, you know. But, you know, they've got other children. They have to work, you know, other responsibilities, right? Well, after, and it could be a day or so when they're still crying and some parents sometimes can't come in. So after that, you're going to see what we call despair. They stop crying. They regress. They start sucking their finger. They start, you know, um, being incontinent where they were potty trained. All of these things, they, they sit in the corner and get quiet. And then you have a parent who couldn't be there. And all of a sudden the parent comes in. They're not going to recognize the parent. They're going to like, you know, keep playing and ignore the parent. That's detachment because they don't want to get hurt again. Right. And those are the three stages of separation anxiety. So these are the things that you see. We know young kids, especially toddlers, they do need somebody in the room with them, especially cognitive delayed any children, right? When it's, you know, later childhood, you know, nine and up into adolescence, parents are not needed as much. Now, don't tell me that they're still needed, but it's not as important a role as their friends and buddies, right? And we know that um, these children um, with this separation anxiety, they are they get to the point where if parents are not there and they don't know what to do. So parents need to be there then. Children who are in the hospital one time usually are not, they have no preconceived ideas of what a hospital is. The one child that you're going to see more reaction or, you know, more um, being worried about it is that kid who's in and out. Could be a kid with sickle cell, right? Who keeps uh, needing frequent admissions. That kid is going to have more something to say about being in a hospital. So you will see all sort of kids. You're going to see kids that mom and dad are inseparable. And then you're going to see some kids that really don't um, get along with their parents. I know working in an ER, I would see kids sitting on a stretcher, tearing up the place, and parents in the corner on their phone watching TV. So they really don't have control of their kids. And you're going to see that. You know, we know that more difficult children are usually male. Of course, cognitively delayed, and those kids with frequent hospitalizations. You know, today we're really saving children more than ever. You know, uh, the newborn ICU and protocols and the way that they treat conditions, and I'll give you a great example, is congenital heart disease. You know, when we get next week, it's all about, you know, hearts and lungs and one of the most difficult of all of the congenital heart defects is a hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Years ago, they sent them home to die. They did nothing. This is in the 80s when I first saw my first one. Today, 98% live. So you see the difference in medical care right there. It's all technology, it's procedures, it's the research. So we've got more kids alive that do have some sort of problem that's going to need medical care. So you can see pediatric hospitals are getting fuller and fuller with sicker kids because we have the ability now to save them and give them a life. 
Going into a hospital is good and bad, right? You know, that bottom picture to the right, that's a kid on CPS and that's all the pumps. And that would be the type of kids I used to take care of in the cardiac ICU. And I loved it. You know, the more intense, the better for me. But it's overwhelming, isn't it? You know, you'll all get to that point if you want that. Um, and understanding it is, is, is uh, amazing. Hospitalization, we can get better quicker. We have nursing taking care of it. And we have somebody to talk to as if you're the parent. So that's a great benefit of hospitalization. There's also parents want to do. And they uh, feel helpless because nursing does it. Also, what if you look like a 14-year-old nurse? I did when I first became a nurse. They question you and your skill. And are you, um, you're taking care of my kid. Do you know what you're doing? That's the hardest part about being a pediatric nurse, right? So they're, the parents are stressed. They feel helpless. They're concerned. Are you the right nurse, right? They're dealing with all of this. So as a nurse, we have to recognize that. And I actually give power back to them. I tell them, your kid came in with this. These are things you need to look for. And as I ever do assessments, as I say, I'm talking to them. What am I doing? Why am I doing? What am I listening for? What is good? What is bad? Parents that are helpless are listening because they want to be a help. And they're your biggest eyes and ears for that child, especially if they're in the room. Now, what about the kids at home? Now, when COVID came, they couldn't go. I mean, thank God for FaceTime today, right? Years ago, we didn't have that. But siblings at home still need to be recognized um, because you've got mom and dad pulled away from their daily lives. You know, and especially if it's a chronic long term or a hospitalization that's long, you need to um, be able to have those uh, siblings at home communicate. You know, I would always send home crayons and hospital coloring books, or I always made bows for my kids or my girls. If there was a sister at home, I'd send one home with the mother. Um, if they're going to visit, they need to know what to expect when they get there. And I do encourage siblings to come in, but remember, they can't be sick. You know, that's the one thing I put masks on all of them because kids are always having a little runny nose. I mean, that's just, especially your younger kids. You know, this kid and his little brother sitting there, you know, looking at each other. I mean, that just says it all. I feel better because my brother's doing okay. Because usually they're little, little daddies, right? Taking care of them. So again, making sure that um, the siblings at home are a part of it. Now, getting a kid ready to the hospital, we need to let them know what's going on. Um, if at all possible, keep that parent with the child. Today, as I said, they walk them into the operating room and the child's knocked out with anesthesia and then the parent leaves so that they're not even knowing if they got an IV in, et cetera, et cetera. So they're doing a lot more like this. They didn't when I first started nursing, okay? But that's what, 40 some odd, I don't even know how many, long time ago. So with these children, make sure that um, you let that kid be as much on routine. And if they're there a long time, make sure that maybe child life can bring up a little puzzle. That won't remember school age likes to be challenged, but the, you got to give them something that they'll be able to succeed. So maybe a 50 um, piece puzzle for a seven, eight year old. It takes a little bit to get it, but when they're done, they'll finish it. So that sense of industry, mastery that task. Schedules, putting them up, important, especially long term kids. So Having a kid who's hospitalized always, again, minimize that separation. Uh, keep that parent in there as much as possible. And the one of the things is that fear of bodily image. Band-Aids are great at certain ages, right? Telling them they'll have surgery, but the insides won't come out. That's that fear that they're worried about. And 
let them understand what they can do. Diversion is amazing in kids. You could be doing all different things and give them an iPad or give them a game, uh, a Switch game. And these kids, you know, will forget that they're in pain. They're in a hospital. You know, I work, worked at a place where they have a playroom that's open, that they have child life there, that if they're not infectious and they're there long term and are able to, we'll bring them up to that playroom. And that will forget I'm in a hospital, right? And we know these expressive activities will show us sometimes what's going on and why they're afraid, right? That's part of it. And always toys, but appropriate, not too small. We don't want them to choke on it. As I said, with the family, put them in charge of something. Have them looking for something because we prepare for a discharge on admission, right? How do we do that? We're not going to teach them all something in the last day. It won't happen. But if every nurse is teaching them why we're doing things, what we're looking for, et cetera, et cetera, dressing change, medications, whatever, and it's going to help. And that will help that child when they get home. Now, we do have different types of hospitals setting things that we do. Now, for instance, you know, ears, uh, tubes, uh, TNAs, tonsils and adenectomies, uh, these are all done in an outpatient. They go in, have their surgeries, they're recovered, they're sent home. That is amazing for the child, okay? Now, it minimizes that stress because they're coming home. Uh, cost savings is huge, all right? And we could do CAT scans, MRIs, x-rays, whatever, but they go home. When you put a kid in isolation, well, we were mentioning varicella, right? Last week, uh, we were, or the week before about varicella and knowing it is, you know, airborne, we might have to put them in a room where it's isolated and you're not going to have as much people going in and out of there because they have to put on some sort of mask or whatever, right? These kids feel isolated. So I would always make sure I would go in and maybe sit there on my computer and do my charting or give them a toy or get child life, do something to keep them stimulated because they're feeling like I'm all alone here. Emergency admissions are rough. You know, this bottom left-hand picture, I worked with that girl. I encouraged her to be LPN to RN, Michelle, and she's an amazing registered nurse today. Still works at that emergency room. Um, and her husband is one of the guys who fly on life flight, which goes transport kids into there. So uh, emergency room, very difficult, especially if it's a trauma. That's where it's hard. But many times parents can't get a hold of the doctor or they come to the ER because we usually don't ask for a deductible at the door, right? So many parents will come and use it as their primary care physician. You'll see that a lot. It is overused in that sort of situation, but that's life. It is what it is. So again, keep the family um, and parents and again, teach them what you're doing, what they need to do to take care of their child. Intensive care. I mean, how stressful can that be? Your kid's being admitted to ICU. You know, um, you need, they, the parent feels, well, at least they're in a controlled situation and monitors and there's all these nurses, et cetera, but they got a kid with all of these things on them and it's overwhelming, right? So again, information, information. You know, the, the family and the child both are stressed. And I think at this time, it's even more the parents. So during the first four days of hospitalization, Eric, age 18 months, crying inconsolably when his parents left him, and he refuses the staff's attention. Now the nurse observes that Eric is settled, uh, appears to be settling in and unconcerned about seeing his parents. The nurse should interpret this as what? It's all about separation anxiety, isn't it? There's three stages. So despair, 
right? Detachment. And at this point, it's the, the detachment. He is like forgetting about his mother. He's done all the crying. He's already regressed and he settled in and he don't care about his parents. That's the third stage. Now, here are the variations that, you know, I was talking about the different. Now, look at all those little blood pressure cuffs. I have one that would fit on my finger. It would wrap. That could be a premature infant. You have a 600 gram, 500 gram premature infant. It's about one pound. Their little legs are this big. They're, they're little calves. And that's usually where I put their blood pressure cuffs. And then you get up to the extra large, which is me, an adult. So everywhere in between. One of the things about children is at age 18, if you are alert, oriented, cognitively aware, you're going to sign your consent. Also, you must give get permission from the child to talk to the parents because they're 18. It's HIPAA. So most parents will say, no, you can talk to me. I'm like, no, I can't. I need approval from your child. And they get upset, but that's the law. Okay. Just remember that. We know that they're the older one. We have emancipated my minors. We can do and treat children on an emergency basis without a signature of consent. You know, if it's life threatening, you come in on trauma, you don't have a consent. You take care of the child and get it later. All right. And then sometimes we'll just get it on the phone and it's a two person, not necessarily nurses, consent. Usually the admission uh, department, the registration clerks do that. So preparation for procedures. Again, teaching these kids what's going to go on. Child life plays a lot in this, right? Let them feel and touch and look and ask questions. These kids do so much better than those kids who don't know what's going to go on. So the procedure, what do you want? Well, you know, these children, you know, uh, need during all of this using play. I'm going to give you a great example. I had a kid who came in who had somehow ruptured her trachea. I think she was 12 years old at the time and she had it replaced. So even this 12 year old, it could have been the younger kid of any age, but her lungs, this is the big thing postoperatively, right? They replaced her breathing tube. I would have her take a straw and do spitballs and I put up a little target. So she, poo, and you know something? She was taking deep breaths and spitting it and her lungs were great. And they were like, wow, her lungs are sounding good. I said, yeah, we do spitballs every night. And the doctor was like, what? Mm, I guess it works. You know, we had fun doing it. And that's distraction. You know, as I said, it could be a video game, could be crayons, could be cards, could be puzzles, or reading a book, whatever. Distraction, distraction, distraction. It really works. And the younger kids using play to teach it's absolutely what you have to do. Surgical procedures, as I said, parents to the end until they're put to sleep really helps. You know, they even start out in the waiting area to give them that what we call the happy juice, that Versed, midazolam. They start to get a little loopy. So by the time you get to the OR, they don't remember, they're sedated. And we are now with every kid going into the OR with anesthesia, we give an antiemetic. A lot of kids would come out vomiting because the, the medicine made it like that. We don't do that anymore. And then if they're going into an OR, we're going to do something to stop those secretions, that atropan, the Robinol, right? This decreases sedation, the secretions, so that they don't have anything to vomit with the antiemetic. Post-op, just like adults. We're going to monitor them, vital signs, managing pain, Remember your pain scales on these kids because those will make your difference. Um, respiratory tract infections, if they're intubated, make sure we're washing our hands, using gloves, using proper equipment, or deep breathing, coughing, et cetera. And then we know education. You're talking to the child. You're talking to the adult. 
um, and you're educating from the moment they walked in. And those are your discharge instructions. So kids and compliance. Now, how do we know that they are working right? Well, you have some parents, some kids that do really, really well, and you're expecting a certain response. And when they don't, many times it's not compliance. They didn't end up taking all of the antibiotics or they didn't come back for their blood draws, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and that's sort of how we can measure compliance. It's the outcome of the child. Skin care, well, it's gonna be just like adults. So we want healthy skin, you know, turning and rubbing areas that are um, pink, um, keeping them dry, um, log, you know, log rolling kids who have to log roll. Um, and we can use pillows. We can use, I use stuffed animals and those little ones I'd have right there with their ET tubes if they were with an intubation. Keeping the pain under control and keeping their fever down, these children do so much better. If you feel better, you're going to do better. Again, always it's environment and it's all about um, safety. So keeping things away, um, teaching parents about those, you know, plugs, making sure that they're covered, somehow furniture, Strings that hang down. I remember very early in my career, I had a kid got strangulated on a blind. The cord was hanging low and they got on it and they, you know, um, they stopped breathing and the parent had to restart it. I mean, in the end, the kid did okay, but you never know. Toys, little things. My grandson, my nine-year-old grandson who just swallowed a quarter, he's in Pensacola right now and he's getting a procedure the GI is going to go down and they have to remove it because it was so far down. Usually if it's stuck in the middle, they'll take a tube and they'll pull it out. A uh, holy catheter, they'll make a balloon and they pull it and that will help it up. But nope. So again, safety. So why do you have a quarter in your mouth? Oh, I don't know. I mean, typical nine-year-old, right? Always remember infection control, universal precautions. The biggest thing that you can do is prevent the transmission of infections. Transporting children around, they can't be carried by the parent. They want to carry them, put them in a wheelchair, they can carry them. I think these radial flyers are great. Um, in the pediatric hospitals, they have that little straps to put in. So strollers, wagons, bassinet cribs, the beds, stretchers making sure that they are safe for their trip to wherever. We don't restrain kids universally. There is a big thing about if you need to put wrist restraints on a child, you have to notify the supervisor because that child now is gonna need a one-to-one -one nurse instead of being restrained. They're in the past, and I'll tell you what happened. We used to have gloves, we used to have posy restraints. We had wrist restraints. We had ankle restraints. And sometimes, and especially in the younger and older, they're going to try to climb out of bed and they're going to hang themselves on it. Or we didn't take the gloves off and their hands turn necrotic or their feet. So we've lost toes, arms, legs, and patients. So we don't use restraints. Now, we can take a blanket and roll it up like a mummy to do a procedure because that's not considered a restraint. Elbow restraints are also okay, but again, we they don't want to pull out a tube or something that can't bend their arm. They can't get to where they you know could hurt themselves by touching whatever. You know, and I think parents holding a child for a blood draw. You know, and this kid has a central line somewhere that they're drawing the blood. Mom's holding them. That's a great enough restraint. So the least minimal possible is what you're going to use. And those are the types that we have. Venipuncture, you know, making sure that you have plenty of people to help you. Again, I have mommy by the face, maybe with a little pacifier. 
doing things to keep them calm. Older kids showing them what we're going to do using numbing stuff. We do that on all of our kids, even infants. We're going to numb it so they feel the touch. They don't feel the pain. But little ones don't want to be held down. So mommy at the bed, you know, by the head, keeps them calm, all right? We know that the, the lumbar punctures, it's usually not done sitting up. It's usually on the side. I usually tell the kid, I'm going to give you this big, big hug. I said, you're going to feel touching on your back. And I says, and you're not going to feel maybe a little bit, but don't move and it be done really quick. But I'll give you a big, big, big hug and a kiss when we're done. And the kids actually do really good. Bone marrow is usually sedation uh, because you hear a crunch, crunch during that. And that can be a little much for some. And we already went over that. We already went over that. Now, how do we collect specimens on an infant? We do heel sticks. Unless we need a bleeding coagulopathy exam, like a PT, PTT, that has to be a venipuncture, an anticube venipuncture. We're going to do it on their heel on either side, not the middle, because the bone, the calcaneus bone's there. And we don't want to hit it to create osteomyelitis, right? So it's either side. We'll warm it up with a hospital-approved warmer. And then we will open it up, clean it, and very easy squeeze it. But if we put the foot down below the heart, it's going to work a lot better. That's why I would sit next to them, below them, in a chair, put their foot over, and very easily squeeze it. We do bags when we don't want a um, sterile procedure. All infants, all young ones, we will do a catheterization straight calf when we are suspecting urinary tract infections. And it's over with pretty quick. Again, parent at the bedside, holding their hands and giving them a pacifier, another nurse holding the legs, and then another nurse quick in and out, and it's a straight calf. They do really well with it. Um, stool, you know, it could be just a swab of inside the anus, and respiratory could be just be in the nose or suctioning. VSA, most, most uh, um, accurate of dosing. We do give milligrams, micrograms per kilogram. I always check um, with another nurse when I don't know. And remember, there's those high alert stuff, heparin, um, any of the cardiac medications, digoxin, IV, um, morphine, draw, um, any narcotics. So any, and there's more, insulin, et cetera. So make sure that you do check it properly. Um, always, always check their ID. Um, that's why those ID bands are so important. That is the biggest reason for medical errors uh, because of no ID. Uh, where do you give medicines? You know, infants, this is vastus lateris. Newborns, vastus lateris. You know, we don't get up to the deltoids, deltoid till later, much, much later on. Again, knowing the size of the needle, knowing how much you can give, and how to give it and where to give it. Many of your pediatric kids will have um, some sort of central line, we call it, which means it goes into the heart. You know, the top right is a broviac, and it will always remain sticking out. So older kids are better with it. Uh, younger kids might pull it, you know, just by regular playing. The kid on the bottom left has you know, a Haber, a Huber needle in into a port. And you see the picture on the right lower, you, you will access that as a registered nurse when they're admitted either the ER or to the floor and you get dressed up sterile, you clean it and then you hold it and it's like metal and you will feel the needle go down and touch metal and then you secure it well. When you're done, we take it out. Most parents know we're going to do that and put numbing cream on there before the kid arrives. So it's numb. Naso, oro, gastrostomy tubes. Always know that if we are giving any tube to make sure that we flush it well, not overly, 
because uh, that's a lot of fluid some kids could get, but enough to keep it going. Um, and it's great because we can sometimes do this. Kids don't even know what we're doing here. Rectal, it works actually pretty quick. Um, many times you'll see parents can't give their kids a Tylenol by mouth. They'll say, all right, I'm just going to give it rectally. And that's what the kid gets all the time at home because they can't make their kid drink the, the medication. So it is a good thing to do. But remember, they could plop it out. They may not get the whole thing, et cetera, et cetera. There's nasal duodenal, nasal jejunal. It just means it's lower. It's a tube in the nose, but it doesn't sit in the stomach because you can still reflux, right? So they put it below the pyloric valve into duodenum or jejunum, and they do slow, continuous feeds. You know, um, they work great that way. And then the reflux, it's not in their stomach. They don't have that vomiting going on. Parents at home can do all of these things. Eye drops, nose drops, remember to get them in the right position. Um, they should be staying there for 30 to sec minutes to um, 30 seconds to a minute so that we can hold it back at, at a minimum. Again, washing hands, cleaning the inside to outside of the ears, low in the nose first. So things to be done. Intake and output, we're going to measure everything, you know, sometimes even flushes. But how do you do output on an infant? Well, we have diapers, right? They pee and they poo in their diaper. Diapers weigh a certain amount. Example, you have a size one diaper, newborn. That weighs 30 grams. And you take it off the child and it weighs 60 grams. The difference between 30 and 60 is 30. That is 30 mLs. Every mL is a gram. So that is 30 mLs, okay? So no that uh, we can measure it very accurately. We don't just stick catheters in these little infants. No, no, no. Parental fluids, you know, the big thing is trying to start them, right? Trying to see the veins. I know some of the sickle cell children as they get older, their veins are really hard to find. You know, and they say, hey, Betty, please help us here because I could find an IV on a rock. But there are little tricks. And that top right is a light. There's all different sort of lights. And we see like a little shadow. And we would turn the lights off in the room and get into it and then have someone turn it on as soon as we're in. And then, of course, protecting it the way that we should. Oxygen, we have a beautiful thing for the little ones, an oxy hood. They still have their mouth and they still have their vision and they look around. Nothing's taped to their face. Best ever. Uh, and it's accurate, it's very accurate, and, and it's very nice for those kids. Remember, there's nasal cannulas, but we have to tape it on those kids, and you got those little things in the nose, and they go like this, and they'll pull it out on you, and then it goes all the way up to being intubated. Remember these O2 sat monitors to move them? There are a light. Don't keep it in one place for, you know, days. You always have to be removing it. There's all sorts of airways. We have trachs, we have endotracheal tubes, making sure we keep them patent. And aerosols, we'll go into this a lot more next week with respiratory. Kids are great. They learn so quickly how to squirt and, and breathe it in. The one on the right is having this little spacer and we know they're gonna get their uh, medicine they want. And then we have, instead of the spacer, we have the aerosol, but sometimes it blows everywhere, right? All types of feedings, we've mentioned them. Um, enemas, we give them for constipation. We don't like to give them routinely. Um, my grandson at age three was just sick and he was being potty drained and he pooped one day. The next day he hadn't gone to the bathroom at all, he urinated, nothing. So I got concerned because there's many different things. And what it was, he was full of stool took an x-ray. So we put an extra big diaper on him. We gave him this, the little tiny enema and everything came and he could pee and he could, you know, move his valves and everything was good, but never, never as a routine. 
change the diet, okay? Ostomies are just like pig peoples, keep them clean. So the preferred site of an IM injection in an infant, which one is it? B. E. For an infant. D. E. D, thank you. It's in the thigh. All the stuff goes in the thigh at first. Your happy, your, you know, all your two, four, six months, um, one year, all in the thigh. As they get older, they'll start going in the arm, but initially in the thigh. So we got it all in. We got your lecture done and just in time. Uh, again, I'll be available to go over your exams. Anybody reach out and I will be more than willing to help you through, okay? No one did so horribly that nobody can come back. So, you know, you're all okay. We're, we're gonna get you there, but ask for help, please. All right? You all have a great evening. Can I ask? Can I ask sure. Oh. May I ask a question? May I ask